From time to time, people ask me if it's possible just to shoot 3D images in the air, and finally it turns out it is possible. Uh, AIST and Hamamatsu have put a lot of resources into getting this done. I believe they use uh, lasers that are so strong that you ionize the air, you create a plasma, and it creates uh, this popping noise that's fairly loud and a bright dot, and if you could steer that point around, they create floating three-dimensional images. And the ones that I saw are maybe a few feet big in diameter. Also, there's been a lot of research in what liquid you could use. So if you imagine just a glass of tap water uh, and shine lasers into it, can you make a 3D image float inside there? And it turns out you can. And I believe the results of their research was that of all the many, you know, 100 or so chemicals they studied, water was actually the best, uh, tap water. So the next topic is holography, which is fairly complex, so I'll just give the uh, overview here. But it was invented, um, or I guess discovered, by Dennis Gabor in 1948, and then he later on won the Nobel Prize for it. Here you could see him sitting at his desk, and then next to it is a hologram of him sitting at his desk. And of course, some benefits of holography are that, yeah, you can move your head around and see around an image, but the focus cues are usually correct, depending on the type of hologram it is because the wave fronts and how they propagate match really well how they really propagate in real life. In cases where you have a synthetic hologram, that is where a computer takes snapshots of something like a car and then makes a hologram of it so you can imagine what it would look like, sometimes those focus cues don't work quite right. But it's still really good. So one, uh, of course, fundamental thing you have to know in order to understand a hologram is that light has this wave nature to it. So it's not like light is a bunch of bullets that shoot through the room and go in perfect rays, even though sometimes it's helpful to think of it that way. Uh, at times they exhibit this wave property. So a photograph of this is if you just took your hand uh, near a piece of paper, and if the light had one really precise color in it, you'd see these bright rings around all your fingers. That's because um, light is diffracted off your hand and is uh, recombining and constructively interfering on the screen, and you can see these interesting patterns. In this case, they said they're using a Heaney beam, which means that they're using a red laser, and they didn't need any, las any lenses to get this effect. So, uh, as you know, waves interfere, meaning that if you have um, regions of light where the energy is both at a maximum, then where it impinges something, that those maxima add up and give you something that looks much more intense. So here's an example uh, in a simulator of interference. In this case, you've got, at the bottom, you can see those two black dots. Those are sources of red light, and the red light has a certain wavelength associated with it. It's about 600 or 700 nanometers, meaning that as it flies across space, the distance between the maxima is about 680 nanometers or so. Anyway, if those two uh, light sources are exactly the same color, or as close as they could be, they are so-called coherent and uh, when they interfere at a screen, they will make a pattern that actually doesn't seem to change in time, even though the light fields are kind of oscillating and rippling in time. At the top, you could see that interference pattern. Well, it turns out, and you need to know quite a bit of math to make this all make sense, but it turns out that you could record things using this property. So, for example, uh, this is a uh, collection of slides that uh, I took from a professor's website that I credit in a few slides you can create a hologram of, say, a single point. And if you agree that you can create a hologram of a single point, you can create images made out of many, many points, such as a real object. So how do you create a hologram of a single point? Well, in this case, you would set up film. Uh, it's like ordinary film, except much more precise, where rather than wanting you know, several hundred little pixels per inch, so to speak, you'd have thousands of pixels per millimeter. You would orient the film in the middle, uh, you would shine a reference wave at it, which is, say, red light from really far away, so that the wave fronts appear to be coming in uh, straight by the time they reach the film. And a little object, like a speck of dust, in front of the film that causes some uh, deviation in that light. Well, the deviated, sort of diffracted light uh, meets up with this reference wave to cr create a hologram. In this case, the hologram, this is like a really fundamental lesson, the hologram of a single point source or a point object is this bullseye pattern, and I believe it's called a Fresnel zone plate. So then if you were to, you know, kind of develop this film, 
and uh, shake it off and have this little tiny bullseye that you can barely see and then shine a laser on it, you will, lo and behold, get an image of a point floating in front of it. This process of playback is shown here and physicists call this reconstruction. So when you shine laser light onto it, uh, you'll see this real image created uh, between you and the film and an identical virtual image on the other side of the film. So typically, uh, you can, I mean, hobbyists can create holograms uh, as follows. You could set up your nice photographic plate and an object, and if you simultaneously shine light on the photographic plate and on that object, uh, the light bouncing off the object will interfere with the light hitting the photographic plate, and it will create a hologram. And then when you turn everything off and develop it and shine just the laser back on it again, you will see that object. So the reconstruction is shown here. So that's all well and good, and got him a Nobel Prize, but it is really difficult to make an electronic display using holography. The reason for this is you just need way too many pixels, at least for technology available in 2010. So let's do an example. You might remember this math from uh, high school or college physics. Let's say you want to be able to create a hologram that steers green light at just 45 degrees. Well, as you know, um, a diffraction grating is something that if you, like an incident plane wave strikes it, light will go straight through, depending on the type of grating, but also create these side lobes um, called diffraction orders at a certain angle with respect to that main or zeroth order line. So the light going straight through is this thing called m equals zero, and the first diffracted order for red is m equals one and m equals minus one. Anyway, let's say it's green light at 45 degrees. The formula works out being that it's uh, the distance between those little grating holes is uh, 510 nanometers, which is the color of the light, divided by the sine of the angle you want, which is 45 degrees. And that all works out to be uh, 1,400 of these little lines per millimeter. So if you can imagine a computer display requiring it, that's a lot of pixels. So how many pixels is that? Well, in the case of green, where you need 1,400 lines per millimeter, then a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter hologram, that's a foot by a foot, needs a resolution of 416,000 pixels by 416,000 pixels. So, and this is uh, exactly the same order of magnitude as a traditional glass hologram. If you were to look at it under a microscope, that's, that's sort of the, the, the grain density of the little silver grains in the holographic film. Now this doesn't prevent people from making holograms using a computer, so if you've got a lot of time to develop the image, it's certainly possible. A company called Zebra Imaging spun out of the MIT Media Lab uh, out of Steve Benton's group, and if you give them some data uh, and some money, they will create a beautiful full-color hologram that you could see from just about any point of view. And they do this uh, using a proprietary technique using something called Hogles, in which um, uh, a lens system slowly steps over uh, the plane of the film while blasting into that a reference and also uh, what that scene looks like from different points of view. Here's a photograph of an image made by Zebra Imaging. This is a, I don't remember if it's life size or quarter scale or something, size of a giant car for Ford. And as you walk past it, you can see inside the car and different um, elements of how it works. 